While no injuries have been reported, the tornado damaged 20 to 30 homes and just under 10 businesses. The mobile clinics will travel anywhere from just down the road in Duck Hill all the way out to Yazoo and Humphreys County. Once they're sure they're all well inside, they got him. SWAT teams had to use tear gas to bring Gandy in after he kidnapped his uncle and held him hostage with a shotgun. After they've started the cool down process, paramedics will monitor the patient's vital signs until the ambulance arrives. It was back through here that one of the pharmacy employees was trapped for close to two hours. Suspects were able to bypass the store's alarm system by tearing a hole in the tin wall at the back of the building. If anyone in Lowndes County or Columbus catches something specific on their camera, they can use the Neighbors app to send it right to law enforcement. The second highest fatality rate in the country among licensed drivers. A big reason why? Highway Patrol says distracted driving. Three helicopters transported close to 100 Mississippi patients flying as far as Nashville to find that open ICU bed. A small splash and a burst of light are all it has taken for the Starkville-based company Glow to make ripples across the world. After finding early success selling their liquid-activated glow cubes, one phone call from a grateful mother changed everything. She had gotten a glow cube, and the first thing she thought about was her four-year-old son, who was autistic and terrified of the bath. Um, and she, she called us because she wanted us to know that it was the first time in months that he had taken a bath without crying. That's when co-founders and Mississippi State alums Anna Barker and Hagen Walker made the switch to selling the early child development toys called Glow Pals. It helps children with the development of their cognitive skills, fine motor skills, color recognition, problem solving, and color sorting. Which also happens to be what their new business partner has been doing for more than 50 years. While it may still read 101 West Main Street here on the outside, but inside, their address is 123 Sesame Street. They launched the new line of Sesame Street Glow Pals back in April. In a month, and uh, for more than half of that, we've been sold out <laughs> because everything's exceeded expectations. And while everyone loves Elmo, it's their new character, Julia, they're even more excited about. Sesame Street recently released um, Julia, who's their first autistic Muppet. Glow is one of the companies they trust to put her in children's hands. It was so amazing that we kind of get to be one of the, the first companies to get to to license her and, and really put her message out there and, and use her as a way to, to celebrate the autism community. Glow has sold 3 million products in over 30 countries, but for Anna and Hagen, the numbers they care about most are how many children they can help. To be able to play a very small part in, in celebrating that community and in helping provide the resources that Sesame Workshop has to them, I think it's a really remarkable thing to be a part of. When I contracted the virus, um, the last thing that came to my mind was it, you know, putting me in a wheelchair. Last November, Whitney Betts was leaving work early because she wasn't feeling well. Walking out, I was almost to the car and like I couldn't feel my legs at all and I kind of just dropped down to the ground. I really didn't know what was happening. Whitney was rushed to North Mississippi Medical Center where doctors told her that not only did she have COVID-19, the virus had caused acute transverse mellitus, a rare and potentially devastating spinal cord disorder. I felt heartbroken that I may not be able to get back how I was, you know, just something simple as just walking. Almost completely paralyzed, Whitney was transferred to NMMC's Rehabilitation Institute. I couldn't dress myself, I couldn't bathe myself, I couldn't even feed myself. You feel helpless. For the next few months, Whitney faced three to four hours a day of intense rehab. But she says it was one moment with a physical therapist and a standing frame where she had her biggest milestone. He wheeled me in front of a mirror. where I can see myself stick. Where I can see myself standing up. They really do need to take time to mourn what has happened to them, to mourn that loss, to process it. Um, the big thing is they can't camp out there. Finally, in July, Whitney took her first steps in nearly eight months. It was incredible because <laughs> um, from that point on, I felt like I could, you know, go all the way. I was only expecting a few feet, 
Um, and I ended up having to push a table out of the way so we could keep going. When she first started walking, Whitney could only go about 32 feet before needing a break. Now, she can go up to 100 feet at a time. This was Whitney's second walk. Okay, there you go. <laughs> Whitney says one of her greatest motivations is her three children. She says she remembers when her daughter Layla saw her standing up for the first time. And she came in, she was like, what are you doing? And I was like, I'm standing. She was like, how? <laughs> but most important of all is the constant belief that she will recover. I really have to have to tell myself over to just be patient because, you know, you want it tomorrow. But the reality is it, it takes a little time, but you'll get there eventually. Hunkered down in the bathtub, and then we heard it get real loud, and Mama thought it was rain. And Daddy said, it ain't no rain or wind out there. 13-year-old Grant Crawford says his family was at home watching TV Sunday night when it hit. All of a sudden, I heard the tornado alarms going off, went downstairs. Mama took me downstairs. Area pastor Chad Logan says he and his family were huddled under the stairs during the storm. Moments later, it was over. There was complete darkness. All the electricity was out and it was very peacefully quiet, almost eer eerie. Calhoun County EMA Director Randy Skinner says there were trees across roads, gas leaks and multiple downed power lines, leaving four to 500 people without electricity that night. While no injuries have been reported, the tornado damaged 20 to 30 homes and just under 10 businesses, leaving debris and devastation everywhere. Crawford arrived to find his family's fabrication shop missing its entire roof and two walls and spent the day clearing away the wreckage. I felt a deep pit in my stomach and felt like I lost a job and all that. and couldn't work no more. Well, today had to work, but still. The 13-year-old says the store was one of his family's sources of income and says they had to work fast to salvage everything before the rain hits. Atmos crews and first responders were out in force Monday. Logan says he hopes to organize more volunteers to help in any way they can. We'll have this damage here tomorrow and the next day and the next day and at that point we will mobilize volunteers uh, to put the city back together. But not everything can be rebuilt. That's where you met my grandmother at. And now it's just bricks and wood. Well, just over a year after moving to a five-day work week, the city of Columbus will be moving back to a four-day work schedule. That's right. The city council made that decision last night also, and it's something city workers have actually been asking for for some time. Our Stephen Pimple joins us live outside City Hall with the details on the change. Stephen. Andrea Winston, the four-day work week is back by popular demand for Columbus employees. After questions about meeting residents' needs prompted a switch to a five-day work schedule in 2020, the mayor and city council now believe they have a plan that can make everyone happy. When I came on board as mayor and sort of going through the budgeting process, every department that I worked with asked if this could come back. That's how important Mayor Keith Gaskin says the four-day work week is to city employees. From 2008 to August of 2020, Columbus operated on a four-day work schedule, but concerns were raised that having the offices closed on Fridays limited service to residents. Now, options like online payment available on the city website address some of those concerns. And click on court division and you'll have the link to pay online. And while employee morale was one factor in the council's decision, it wasn't the only one. The city was actually able to save money uh, when we were at a four-day work week, obviously cutting down on uh, electric bills, saving fuel, and those kinds of things. Columbus had been operating on a five-day work week since last August, but starting in December, city offices will once again be closed on Fridays. We've only been away from it for a year. That was a transition. Um, a lot of employees did not like 
uh, having to come in five days. Mayor Gaskin says there will also be plans for addressing special situations with departments like public works or building permits. During this time, we'll, we will be looking at every uh, potential area where there might be an inconvenience to a citizen because the offices won't be open on that Friday. That schedule goes into effect the first full week of December. And we truly believe that we can have this policy in place for our employees and still be you know, a well-run uh, city government. The mayor says that all department heads have turned in information to City Hall about how their offices will operate moving forward. He added that all that information will be posted on social media. Reporting live in Columbus, Stephen Pimpo, WCBI News.